This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at MUBI.com slash Film Fatales. What's the like the taste of butter? A pretty dress? What's the like to live deliciously? everyone long time no see past month i had an obscene amount of just random health issues so sorry for ghosting you all but i'm back today with my horror deep dives to look at the evolution of the witch in film the history of the witch is a long and comprehensive one as the figure of the witch has been featured in everything from disney cartoons to riverdale as much as I'd like to look at Twitches and Halloween Town, I'm going to focus on the presence of the witch in the horror genre and how recent horror films have subverted sexist stereotypes. I'm going to condense some of the history to illustrate this shift, so I'm purposely leaving out some films. For example, I'm not including Carrie because I already made a video on Carrie. And she also doesn't exactly fit what I'm talking about today. So since there are so many witches in film, TV shows, etc., I can't possibly mention them all. So I'm sorry if I don't mention your favorite witch. Modern Girls made an excellent video that gives a really comprehensive overview of the general cinematic history of the witch. That helped me in my research and I'd recommend checking it out if you're interested in the broader subject of witches in general. I'm going to focus on three recent horror films, The Witch, The Love Witch, and Fear Street 3. I think that they're excellent examples of subverting stereotypes and they also share common elements and themes. I'm also going to touch on the craft briefly, so there's spoilers for all those films. Though witch hunts have occurred all over the world, I'm going to focus on Europe and the US as the films that I'm looking at deal most strongly with that legacy. There are also a lot of theories proposed as to the background and the reasoning behind the witch hunts, but I just picked out the most dominant theories among historians to form the basis for the section. The persecution of witches in history in 17th century Salem or in early modern Europe, for example, was highly gendered. The witch hunts were an attack on the oppressed and the ostracized. Women and poor people who couldn't defend themselves were often targeted. Widows and single old women were accused because people didn't trust women that weren't under the control of a man. Midwives and healers were also accused because their knowledge of nature and healing was viewed as suspicious or threatening. There was also a lot of suspicion around women who didn't have kids and mothers rejecting their maternal instinct was viewed as a sign of the devil when nowadays we'd recognize that as something like postpartum depression. This all suggests that women who did not adhere to gender roles had a higher likelihood of being accused. Feminist critic Silvia Federici states that the witch was, quote, the embodiment of a world of female subjects that capitalism had to destroy. The heretic, the healer, the disobedient wife, the woman who dared to live alone. Part of the reason for this gendered imbalance was that women were thought to be the weaker sex and thus more susceptible to the influence of the devil. Keep in mind that at this time and in these areas, Christianity was very much the dominant cultural force. People thought that witches made pacts with the devil, signing his book, and sleeping with him. And witches were also thought to convene on the Sabbath with each other and the devil to share in some group delights. The idea of the witch was basically Lil Nas X's Montero video. Witchcraft was deemed to be heresy, and the accused were tortured to obtain confessions, which often resulted in false confessions and false accusations. The execution for heresy in early modern Europe was burning at the stake, hence the idea of the witch burning at the stake was born. Historians estimate 40 to 50,000 witches to have been executed in Europe at this period, with the peak of the witch hunts between 1550 and 1650. 
The majority of the accused, an estimated 80%, were women, and the majority of the accusers were men. So you can see how prevalent the imbalance between the sexes was. Though the witch trials were motivated in part by the fear of women and women's power, that's not to say that people used witchcraft as a cover to just kill women. <laughs> people really believed in the threat that witchcraft and the devil posed to their communities. There are many reasons why communities led witch hunts, including mass hysteria and scapegoating. And those factors are also present in the films I'm going to look at. Cheryl Renee Shanassa defines scapegoating as, quote, the process of punishing or sacrificing a person or a collective for the sins, failures, or mistakes of others. After factors like war, disease, crop failure, and famine had destabilized communities, people were eager to find somewhere to lay the blame, and witches were often the victim of this. In recent years, women have sought to reclaim the figure of the witch. In 1968, a feminist group called Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, or Witch, formed in the U.S. to fight for women's lib. And at women's marches over the past few years, women have been photographed holding up signs like, We are the granddaughters of the witches you couldn't burn. The term witch hunt has been co-opted by the conservative right in the past few years to paint guilty powerful men as unfairly accused, effectively stripping the term of all meaning. The current wave of magical women on screen aims to illustrate that the witch hunts were not an attack on the elite, but the oppressed and ostracized. So with that cultural background, hopefully the stereotypes and subversions of the films I discussed will be clearer. So now let's look at some films. The predominant image of the witch in our collective consciousness is likely to look like an ugly old woman with a black pointy hat, green skin, a broomstick and a black cat, cackling women crowded around a bubbling cauldron, women who kidnap and eat children, and are in general harbingers of chaos. In early cinema, this kind of witch was portrayed to be pure evil, and their bad nature is reflected in their outward appearance. Only bad witches are ugly. The image is most strongly tied to The Wizard of Oz, which introduced the witch's green skin. It's important to note that this characterization of early witches, also found in Disney cartoons, perpetuates anti-Semitic stereotypes like large hooked noses and discolored skin, characters that are evil, motivated by greed, money, or power, and threaten to steal children. The gendered and stereotyped characterization and treatment of witches is all the more clear when we look at male witches. Men are often called wizards or warlocks instead of witches. You're a wizard, Harry. Despite having the same abilities. None of the powerful wizards are ever objectified or treated differently because of their appearance. They're often characterized as wise old men who are all powerful. They don't have an inherent good or bad nature, but instead use their power for their own motivations. If they are punished, it's because of their actions and not because of any systematic oppression or mass hysteria, as is often the case with female witches. There are also racial dimensions to note in the character of the witch. The majority of witches have been white women, with women of color confined to practicing hoodoo, voodoo, or some kind of vague native or tribal magic. They occupy roles like the voodoo priestess, the gypsy fortune teller, the witch doctor, or the indigenous folk witch. Tichuba, the first woman accused of practicing witchcraft in Salem, was an enslaved woman of color, but despite that, the overwhelming image of Salem witches in media is persecuted white women. I grew up on white girl shit like Charm and Sabrina the Teenage Cracker. I didn't know that there even were black witches. The 1974 musical The Wiz, a retelling of Wizard of Oz with an all-black cast, was the first depiction of black witches who weren't confined to racial stereotypes. Since then, the Crafts Rochelle opened the door to more black witches practicing magic. I found that besides the craft and twitches, much of the progressive, intersectional depiction of witches 
has been on TV with TV shows like American Horror Story Coven, The Vampire Diaries, The Magicians, and The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, all featuring women of color as witches in their main cast. Since a TV show encompasses so much more than a film, it's difficult to provide a concise, in-depth analysis that doesn't warrant its own video. So, sorry for the imbalance towards white witches. I struggled to find films that had women of color as witches that also posed an interesting challenge to the figure of the witch, but if you do know of any, please let me know. An interesting question to keep in mind when looking at witches in film is where do they get their power? The result has an impact on the overall message of the film. In films like Snow White and The Wizard of Oz, both of which came out in the late 1930s, the witch got her power from a fantastical source, and the fantasy setting of these films divorced them from reality. So, different ways that magic appears results in different levels of realism. Are they seemingly normal people engaging in occult practices, or are they completely fantastic? with some inherent power that's given no explanation. The fantastical worlds like those of Snow White and Oz separated the witch figure from her historical roots. She was no longer a descendant of the persecuted woman of Salem. She was a fairy tale monster come to life. In modern feminist horror, however, witches are often no longer one-dimensional monsters, but humans with special gifts. Many modern depictions of the witch show her engaging with Wiccan practices, and in these narratives, women are often scapegoated or oppressed, and magic is the only avenue to overcoming subjugation. Recent films have displayed a trend to humanize the witch and tell her tale with more sympathy, suggesting that her actions are in response to mistreatment, not the result of an inherent evil. Maleficent and Wicked are two examples of this trend, as they both flesh out one-dimensional figures of classic films to frame the witch with sympathy rather than fear. I think this sentiment, treating witches as people worthy of sympathy rather than fearful monsters, summarizes the modern treatment of witches, especially in feminist cinema. The change in the depiction of the witch really started in the 1990s as witches have been treated with more nuance and the line between good and evil has been blurred. Witches are no longer only portrayed as inherently evil, but a result of how they use their power. And this all started with the craft. Girls, watch out for those weirdos. <laughs> we are the weirdos, mister. The Craft came out in 1996 and marked a turning point in the depiction of the witch. I'm not going to do an in-depth analysis of this film, but pick out some points that influenced later films. For those of you who aren't familiar with The Craft, it revolves around four teenage girls who form a coven and use magic to attain their desires. The coven consists of Nancy, Bonnie, Rochelle, and new student Sarah. The girls are unpopular outcasts, and they all long for solutions to their problems. Sarah is mentally ill and slut-shamed at her new school, and she casts a spell on popular boy Chris to make him fall in love with her. Nancy lives with her abusive and alcoholic mom and stepfather, and uses her powers to give her stepdad a heart attack, after which Nancy and her mom cash in on his life insurance policy. Rochelle is subject to racism and relentlessly bullied by the popular girls, so she causes the main bully Laura's hair to fall out. Bonnie has burn scars all over her body and casts a spell to get rid of them. The coven disintegrates as Sarah expresses concern over the damage their actions have caused, and the other three try to kill her without success. In the end, Sarah is the only one left with powers, and Nancy is locked up in a psychiatric hospital. I think this film was, and still is, so powerful and popular because the teen girls dealt with teen issues. Depression, bullying, self-image, and family issues. And witchcraft is framed as a way to regain power in the face of oppression and suffering. Their issues resonated with audiences, and the film shined light on the outcasts that are usually brushed over. Unlike the typical teen films of the 90s, like Clueless and She's All That, the characters aren't concerned with popularity, but prioritize their own power and confidence. 
I think it also works better than the new coming of age witch narratives like Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, where the protagonist battles demons from hell and rules the underworld, issues no teen could relate to. One of the biggest differences between the craft and the films that came before it is the way it depicts magic. The rituals in the film are based on real Wiccan practices, and the power is a direct result of their engagement with these rituals. Magic is not portrayed as inherently good or bad, but subject to how you wield it, showing much more nuance in the character of the witch than the good-bad binary of earlier films. True magic is neither black nor white. It's both because nature is both. The only good or bad is in the heart of the witch. The film also emphasizes the importance of sisterhood and community, a common thread throughout witch films. The craft really laid the groundwork for a nuanced and three-dimensional portrayal of the witch, and you can see its impact on later films. I am that very witch. When I sleep, my spirit slips away from my body and dances naked with the devil. The Witch takes place in 17th century New England and follows a staunchly Puritan family as they leave their plantation because of differing beliefs. The family consists of William, Catherine, and their children, Thomason, Caleb, twins, Jonas and Mercy, and Samuel. Shortly after moving to a new home beside the woods, Samuel goes missing. We see that he was taken by a witch, but his family thinks a wolf stole him. Thomason is blamed for his disappearance and their misfortunes in general. It seems as if she can do nothing right in her mother's eyes. She's blamed for her siblings misbehaving, her mother's cup going missing, and her brother and father are complicit in her scapegoating. Inexplicable mystical occurrences continue to occur. Not long after Samuel's disappearance, Caleb enters the forest to hunt and finds a hovel where a seductive witch approaches him. Caleb returns home that evening naked and ill. He vomits up an apple and rants passionately about religion and Christ before dying. The twins accuse Thomason of being a witch, so William locks them all up. Chaos ensues, and the witch kills the twins, Black Philip kills Will, and Thomason kills her mother in self-defense after she attacks her. Alone, Thomason speaks to Black Philip, who reveals himself to be the devil, and promises Thomason a fruitful life. She signs his book and goes into the woods, where she joins a circle of witches and levitates in the air. In interviews about this film, Robert Eggers has repeatedly emphasized the amount of research and effort that went into making this film an accurate representation of a 17th century Puritan folktale. Animal familiars, blood coming from a goat, the goat as the devil, which is stealing babies, and signing the devil's book are all aspects of folklore and beliefs that people had about witches. In line with the period accuracy, the scapegoating of Thomason is emblematic of the women accused during the witch trials. Much of the threat posed by Thomason lies in her developing asexuality. Caleb seeks glances at Thomason's chest, illustrating his developing asexuality. And at the end of the film, Kate calls her a proud slush, suggesting that Thomason tried to seduce and steal away her father. Their solution to this threat is to get rid of Thomason, either by marrying her off or having her tried as a witch, likely resulting in her execution. The Witch in Red also reflects fears surrounding women's asexuality. She is both a seductress and a crone. She appears to be a seductive, attractive woman, but this is a glamour for the old hag underneath, displaying the mistrust that people have toward seductive women and the fear of what lies beneath their attractive appearance. This witch and others reside in the woods, and throughout the film, the witch is linked with the natural imagery of the woods. When we first see the woods, we hear a group of women vocalizing, connecting the woods with the feminine. Shots of the woods are later throughout the film, and the trees seem to loom over the characters. At the end, once Thomason has signed the Devil's Book, she enters the woods and the final shot is of her levitating body against a backdrop of trees, symbolizing how she's one with nature and a part of the collective of witches. Critics have been divided over the ending of this film. Some have lauded it as a feminist empowerment narrative, to which Robert Eggers responded, I didn't set out to make a feminist empowerment narrative, but I learned that writing a witch story is kind of one of the same. I want to discuss the 
ending of the witch as Thomason submits the devil and whether this can be read as a feminist empowerment or swapping out God or her father or society for a different patriarch. Is the ending a tale of liberation or manipulation? Some critics state that at the end, Thomason has escaped her abusive family and broken free of patriarchal control to live deliciously. Diane Cohen wrote an article entitled, The Witch Isn't a Horror Flick. It's a high-powered feminist manifesto, in which she states that Thomason achieves self-determination. Quote, she's now a woman with the awesome power to determine her own life. Other critics are less inclined to read the ending as empowering. They point to the influence of the devil or Black Philip throughout the narrative and how he manipulated the family in order to leave Thomason alone and vulnerable, susceptible to his influence. Jess Joho at Killscreen asks, quote, how can Thomason's story be one of female empowerment when, as the final scenes imply, she chooses Satan because she literally has no other choice? At the end, Thomason appears joyful, but how long will this feeling of liberation last? I think both readings are valid depending on how much faith you put into the devil's promise, but I definitely lean more towards the second, less positive one. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on the ending. All my life, I've been tossed in the garbage. Except when men wanted to use my body. So I decided to find my own power. And I found that power through witchcraft. The next film is The Love Witch. And if you haven't seen it, it's actually available to stream on today's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe, and it's the place to find everything from new, independent art house films to classic favorites. Every day, Mubi presents a new film, each one thoughtfully handpicked by their team of curators, so there's countless films to choose from. The Love Witch and The Worst Person in the World are now streaming on Mubi in the UK and Ireland. I highly recommend watching The Worst Person in the World if you're in your 20s and you want to have a, an emotional crisis about your life choices, but that's not speaking from like experience or anything. Whether you want to watch non-sploitation or slow, evocative documentaries, Mubi is the place to do it. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash filmfatales. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash filmfatales for a whole month of great cinema for free. Thank you so much to Mubi for sponsoring this video. YouTube loves to demonetize my videos on horror and feminism, so sponsors are a really great way of keeping this channel sustainable, and I really appreciate everyone. Watching The Love Witch, you wouldn't know it was released only six years ago. The film is an ode to 50s and 60s technicolor and horror. The costumes, the lighting, the bad acting are all relics of an older cinema. The film follows Elaine, who moves from San Francisco in hopes of starting a new life after she murdered her husband. Elaine is a witch, brewing love potions and witch bottles in her friend's apartment, which is decorated in a distinctly witchy aesthetic. Over the course of the film, Elaine seduces several men using a combination of her seduction techniques and love spells. Two of the men die as a result of their obsessive love, but Elaine regards these men with disdain and thinks they're over-emotional. One of these men was her friend Trisha's husband, but Elaine is a narcissist who seems only to care about herself, with no thought as to how her actions impact others. She falls in love with a local policeman, Griff, who finds out what she's done, and Elaine murders him. At the end of the film, she hallucinates her ex-lovers, saying they love her, and she seems content to live in a fantasy. Director Anna Biller references various cinematic eras through her style. The opening scene is reminiscent of Hitchcock's Psycho, and she drew inspiration from Jacques Demy's color palettes. She also nods to 1960s XE exploitation films in her film, but sets the love witch apart through her use of the female gaze. There's a huge focus on eyes and Elaine's power to bewitch men through her gaze, and men often speak directly into the camera, linking our perspective with Elaine's. Elaine objectifies herself, constructing a carefully curated mask in order to present herself as the ultimate male fantasy. 
She used to be an exotic dancer, again suggesting that she likes to perform for the male gaze. Despite her own objectification, however, the film doesn't objectify her, and the nudity in this film is presented plainly, not lingering on body parts except in the sequences where Elaine performs a striptease. And I think in these instances, rather than objectifying and dehumanizing Elaine, it's reflective of her own objectification. Anna Biller researched modern witchcraft for this film, and some of the cast who played witches were actual practicing witches. The film speaks to early scapegoating. The witches are disliked by the community and they're blamed for local murders. Towards the end, when Elaine speaks about being a witch in a bar, she is stripped, humiliated, and almost essayed by a group of men who chant, burn the witch. And this scene in particular is a modern reimagining of the mass hysteria and scapegoating of the witch trials. Like the craft, Elaine turns to witchcraft in order to regain power in the face of patriarchal oppression. It's revealed through flashbacks that she was abused by her husband and her father, berated over her weight and her lackluster housekeeping. Unfortunately, even the coven cannot escape male dominance as the high priest teaches new witches SEX magic by sleeping with them, and Elaine seems very uncomfortable around him, suggesting he's abusing his power. The film destabilizes gender stereotypes as the men fall madly in love with Elaine while she's more detached. It's a reversal of films like Fatal Attraction, where a woman's obsession with a man leads to her death. Elaine states that men are very fragile and calls one a p for being over-emotional as she is cold and unfeeling towards them, adopting the stereotypical masculine role of a lover. Though Elaine cycles through lovers, she doesn't find satisfaction with any of them. They're all either over-emotional or don't like her once they see past her good looks. At the end of the film, her life mirrors her art. However, in her painting, the woman holds a man's heart, and in reality, Elaine never had it. The Love Witch's engagement with the 1960s doesn't stop at its style. The film speaks to issues of 1960s housewives that formed the basis of Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique. They were also present in witch sitcoms of the period, like Bewitched and The Addams Family. Housewives of the era struggled to reconcile their desire for power and independence while also performing the role of the perfect housewife and they had little freedom to choose their life paths. Though this is true of white suburban housewives, poor women and women of color had significantly less power and less freedom of choice, which is something that Betty Friedan overlooks in her book. It's not necessarily relevant to The Love Witch, but important to flag nonetheless. In the film, the feminine mystique-esque tension manifests in Elaine's relationships. She wants to be a perfect wife, but can't balance it with her witchcraft. She must choose between the two and ultimately keeps her power, but lives in a fantasy, showing how it was impossible for her to be both married and free. Frieden wrote in The Feminine Mystique, who knows what women would be if they were free to be themselves. Maybe, just maybe, they be witches. Fear Street 3 is a part of the Fear Street trilogy, which came out last year. These films function as both homages to and subversions of classic horror tropes, notably in the slasher genre with nods to films like Friday the 13th and Scream. The most notable subversion, however, isn't in the film's style, but in its substance. The overarching plot across the three films is that there is a town called Shadyside, which the inhabitants believe to be cursed. Every few years, someone goes on a murderous rampage, and the town has seen the rise and fall of several serial killers over the years. Locals believe this to be the work of a witch, Sarah Fear, who was killed in 1666. The first film takes place in 1994 and introduces the trilogy's main characters, Dina and her girlfriend Sam, Dina's brother Josh, the sheriff Nick Good, and the only survivor of the previous serial killer, Ziggy. The group fight a Scream-esque serial killer as they try to break the town curse. At the end of the film, Sam and Dina have reconciled, but Sam gets possessed. The second film jumps back two decades to show the previous serial killer massacre a summer camp, and we see clues as to what happened with Sarah Fear, who was said to have made a deal with the devil. 
Back in the present day, Dina goes to where Sarah's body is buried and is thrown back to 1666, experiencing life through the perspective of Sarah. The third film tells the true story of Sarah Fear, who is revealed not to be a witch, but a young lesbian persecuted for her sexuality. We see mass hysteria grip the townspeople after a series of misfortunes, and they scapegoat Sarah and her love interest, Hannah. I saw Hannah Miller and Sarah Fear. I saw Hannah Miller. I saw Hannah Miller. I saw Hannah Miller. I saw Sarah Fear. Sarah sacrifices herself to save Hannah, confessing that she is the witch, but we find out that the actual witch is Solomon Good, who sacrificed people for power and wealth. In the present day, the witch bloodline continues with the resident white man in power, the sheriff of Sunnyvale, Nick Good. Sunnyvale Town as a whole benefits from this at the expense of Shadyside. Dina kills Nick and breaks the curse, she reunites with Sam, and they live happily ever after in a newly fortunate shady side. Like the craft and the love witch, the power in this film comes from engaging in occult practices, though the film doesn't go as far as to suggest other potentially more positive ways to use the power. The film uses the good family to comment on corruption and the abuse of power, but what I find particularly interesting about this trilogy is how it draws us into participating in the scapegoating of Sarah Fear in the first couple films. It evokes the stereotype of the vengeful witch that was persecuted and comes back to haunt a community like those in The Conjuring or The Blair Witch Project. 1666, Sarah Fear was hanged for witchcraft. Fact. But ever since she was executed, she's been possessing people, turning them into killers to take revenge on the town. Only to subvert the trope by revealing the witch to be the sheriff and the woman to be innocent. This scapegoating illustrates how history continues to be biased against women and queer people, instead privileging the voices and stories of white men. It also speaks to how the actions of men turn women into witches, either by accusing them and transforming them into a false witch, or by making them turn to witchcraft for power and freedom from patriarchal oppression, as is the case in The Love Witch and The Craft. The only bad thing I want to say about Fear Street 3 is that I think they were going for what the witch did in terms of period accuracy, but one thing just absolutely does not work, and that's the accents. I'm not marrying Solomon bloody good, if that's what you're driving at. Full moon rises before nightfall. Just think of it as my dowry. Father wanted to prove. I will go back to the wood. Only I've grown tired of watching fortune turn a blind eye to me. I think they were going for an Irish accent, but it's an absolute bastardization of an Irish accent. And the fact that I can't even tell what accent they were going for just illustrates how bad it was. I get a lot of questions about my own accent, and despite it being in the FAQ of all my descriptions, I <laughs> was born and lived in America when I was younger, but grew up the majority of my life in Ireland. My whole family is Irish, and so I think I'm qualified to comment on Irish accents. And the Irish accents in Fear Street are some of the worst I've ever heard. <laughs> it's a small detail, but I wish that they just kept their American accents because every time I heard them say like father <laughs> or something, it like just threw me out of it. That's my major bone to pick with this film. I think they did something really interesting with the witch character and I love their allusions to past slasher films, but maybe let's pass on the accents next time. Overall, I think these films offer really great case studies on how modern and feminist horror treat the witch. Instead of a one-dimensional monster who's a source of terror, she's a figure worthy of sympathy and nuance. With all these films, the witch isn't an inherently evil figure, but often someone who turns to witchcraft as a result of mistreatment and abuse. Thank you so much for watching this video. As always, I really appreciate your support and I hope you enjoyed my examination of the witch character and I'll see you soon in my next video.